All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our eighth session of the Morrison Forster and Nucleate Advanced Topics and Patent Law course. We have a great session lined up for you today, which will focus on trade secret strategies for life sciences. It's going to be led by my friend and partner, Mark Whitaker. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items before we start. Keep in mind that uh, if you have any questions, so please use the Q&A feature and we will do our best to answer your questions during the presentation. If anyone has any technical difficulties, please contact Nora Moore. If um, many of you have taken advantage of our office hours, uh, there's still time to participate. So if you're interested in a 30 minute consultation with a MOFO attorney or patent agent, please send an email to us and introduce yourself and we will get you connected to the right person. So with that, I turn it over to Mark. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, great uh, to be here with you all this afternoon. So good afternoon and welcome to the session. Um, we're going to be discussing trade secrets uh, strategies for life sciences. Um, I've received some questions prior to our session today, some of which will be answered uh, during the course of the next hour. Uh, but hopefully we'll have uh, a little bit of time at the end uh, to field some questions. I think uh, Mike may even introduce the questions during the course of the presentation. So we've got a lot to cover, uh, so let's get to work. Next slide. So who cares about trade secrets? Um, billions and billions lost, according to the FBI. Notwithstanding our politically charged atmosphere and division, uh, for some reason, when it comes to intellectual property, Congress demonstrates an uncanny ability to work across those divisions and actually pass some legislation. Uh, we'll talk more about the trade secret statutes uh, in a few minutes. Um, and alas, also, uh, Mr. Lewandowski, uh, of self-driving car fame, found out the hard way that theft of IP, theft of trade secrets, does not just warrant civil penalties, but also criminal ones as well. Next slide. So some common scenarios in trade secret misappropriation that uh, we'll hit today. A key technical employee moves to a competitor. Uh, employees leave en masse to join a competitor former partner applies for patents based on some joint R&D work that were done. And a competitor then sends a demand letter after you hire a new employee that used to work for them. Next slide. So what are some of the recent policy uh, and legislation changes that we're going to be talking about in part today? Uh, first, the Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed, and it's a federal law, was passed uh, by President Obama back uh, in 2016. Um, it underscored Congress's desire to align closely with what is called the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which roughly 48 states in the United States have passed. Um, and this DTSA uh, essentially is extended the Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which criminalized certain trade secret misappropriations. Following two years thereafter, the European Union uh, came out with a trade secrets directive. Now this directive uh, does not have direct legal effect, but if you were to look today, virtually every uh, member state of the European Union now has in place a trade secret law very similar to the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Next slide. So what are the basics? Uh, what can be a trade secret? Essentially anything. It can be a formula, a process, abstract ideas. Um, it has to be maintained as secret and continue to be secret. And unlike patents, independent development is a complete defense to an, assertion, to an assertion of trade secret misappropriation. Next slide. So what is a trade secret? What is considered a trade secret, for example, under Massachusetts law? Uh, it can be a formula pattern, compilation, technique. Uh, it can also be uh, something like a customer list. It has to provide certain economic advantage and it has to have some value. It doesn't have to have a large 
money value, but it has to have some value and not be generally known. Um, and with respect to uh, misappropriation itself, um, when reasonable notice is given um, to protect against it being acquired, disclosed, or used without the consent of the person asserting it as a trade secret. Next slide. So let's break down some of these elements uh, to flesh out what this trade secret misappropriation looks like. First, uh, with respect to the term of economic advantage, what is meant by it? It includes actual or potential economic value. Thus, a trade secret would include the currently valuable recipe uh, of Coca-Cola, uh, as well as the yet to be marketed revamped recipe for Coke 2. It also includes information that has economic value from a negative viewpoint. So for example, in the context of life sciences research, the results of research studies showing that a process will not work also qualifies as a trade secret. Next slide. Whether competitors of the trade secret hold uh, actually actual knowledge or can easily discover the trade secret, that's what's uh, meant by not generally known or readily ascertainable. Trade secrets may also include combinations of elements uh, that are already in the public domain if the trade secret constitutes something that is unique, it's effective, successful, valuable uh, in, in integration of that public domain information. And just because something exists out there in public, on the internet or elsewhere, especially if it was not unlawfully, uh, not lawfully published on the in internet, that also can qualify as a trade secret. Next slide. Reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. The extent of the security measures taken by an owner of a trade secret need not be absolute or complete. They just must be reasonable under the circumstances, depending on the facts of the specific case, as well as those types of measures that are typically done by others in similar industries. So reasonable efforts can include advising employees of the existence of a trade secret, limiting access to the information on a quote, need to know basis, and storing the information on, for example, a computer database accessible only by a special password. Next slide. So what are some examples of trade secrets? On the technical side, they can include technical information, records of original research, laboratory notebooks, manufacturing processes and recipes and formulas. But they also can include non-technical and these are equally as valuable. Things like client or customer lists, uh, strategic plans, uh, marketing plans and pricing strategies. Next slide. So some of you may be asking uh, the question, well, why we should be, be caring about trade secrets. Why don't we just patent everything? Well, let's look at some comparative costs. Prosecuting patents in key jurisdictions where intellectual property protection matters or protecting that information within a company. So what do you do after you've identified your IP? Do you patent the ideas or maintain them as trade secrets? Um, consider the following. Will a patent generate licensing streams or favorable cross-license terms? Is that the reason why you want the patent? Or is it primarily for defensive purposes to exclude competitors and increase market share? You may want to consider just maintaining the secrecy of that invention. It may also, however, raise anti-competitive issues, but that <laughs> is something for another class. Next slide. So what is a strategy for reviewing specific trade secrets? Um, first, the identification and strategy. What problem did the company or your university solve in developing this technology? Um, then you want to evaluate the existing protections. Are these uh, issues, these uh, problems, these inventions um, currently trade secrets? 
are they currently contained within a public patent? Uh, did they start off as trade secret and then they were patented? Or are they already in the public domain uh, and publicly disclosed? And then finally, assessing the strength of protection. Uh, does everyone need access? Um, I will tell you a story. Uh, I uh, was involved in counseling a company that had in one of its departments, 3,000 employees in the department, and all of them, they claimed, had to have knowledge of the trade secret. Well, some of these people were engineers, some people were administrative personnel, some people were involved in sales and marketing. And so after a review, uh, we recommended, and the, the company finally did uh, start closing the, the door on these trade secrets, they ended up uh, going down and, and just giving access to the trade secrets to about 50 of their employees, mostly just the engineers and scientists who are working. So that's a big question to always ask. Next one. Okay, let's turn to my favorite topic. Um, I am a litigator, so I love litigation. Um, prior to the passage of the Defend Trade Secrets Act, uh, this was essentially the state of play in the United States uh, with respect to trade secrets laws. 48 of the 50 states adopted some version of the UTSA. Um, there were also federal uh, laws that were out there. I mentioned the Economic Exp Espionage Act. There, was a compute there is a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And of course, the International Trade Commission. Next slide. The DTSA. Defend Trade Secrets Act, again, enacted in 2016. Um, around now 1,400 federal trade secrets cases are filed annually, including many uh, that we'll be talking about uh, in just a few moments involving life sciences uh, activities. The most popular jurisdictions are those noted on the screen. Um, uh, it, uh, the act addressed the trade secret definition and seizure it also added in a very important component, and that is whistleblowers. Next slide. Here's some quick, quick facts. Uh, we have noted uh, and observed this activity for quite some time, and that is that in life sciences cases, we've seen an increase, steady increase, in healthcare and pharmaceutical trade secrets cases across the United States and internationally, where the misappropriation, for example, occurred entirely outside the United States. Next slide. The courts have clarified that the DTSA cause of action can be based on misappropriation that occurred even prior to that effective date back in 2016, but only if the unauthorized use of the trade secrets continued after the DTSA's effective date. And we cited a case here as well, Sintel Sterling. Next slide. So what are some of the remedies under this federal law? Injunctions are available. Those can be difficult to prove because you have to prove something called irreparable harm to your business uh, that is not compensable by damages. There's also a statute of limitations uh, contained in the, in the act that uh, after the misappropriation is discovered, you have three years to file your action uh, for uh, redress. Next slide. Damages that are available, things like actual loss, unjust enrichment, uh, and in lieu of damages, if those are not calculable, um, a reasonable royalty and a license. Um, and there's also some availability of enhanced damages up to two times the amount of the calculated compensatory damages if the trade secret is willfully and maliciously misappropriated. Now, um, as you will see in some of the cases that we're going to go through, there are times when the uh, individuals who take trade secrets do so both willfully and maliciously. They purposely take the trade secrets. There are other instances, however, where there is an innocent taking of the trade secret by an employee um, going to a competitor, uh, and that ends up not being enhanced 
when damages are accrued. So we'll go through some of those examples in just a few minutes. And also attorney's fees are available if there's some willful misappropriation of a trade secret. Next slide. I mentioned a short while ago the, the importance in the DTSA of protection of whistleblowers. So individuals uh, cannot be held criminally or civilly liable under federal or state treaty secret law if they have identified, come forward in confidence uh, to a federal or state government official or directly to an attorney like me, um, or solely for the purpose and solely for the purpose of reporting and investigating a suspected violation of law. So no longer uh, is it true, and you'll see this, you've seen this in the news. We saw it very recently with respect to um, Facebook, Google, others, uh, who unfortunately uh, had folks come forward as whistleblowers and uh, make these claims. They could not have action taken against them uh, as long as the information that they provided was truthful and factual. Next slide. There's also a notice requirement that's required. Uh, so this is important uh, that the DTSA now requires that contracts or employment agreements with employees must include a notice requirement concerning uh, this, this uh, new law, this Defend Trade Secrets Act. Uh, and the language has to be specific um, and there's no penalty uh, for uh, exemplary damages and attorney's fees. Next slide. I spoke a little while ago also about the application to foreign activity. The DTSA does apply to conduct misappropriation that occurs outside the United States if the offender is a natural citizen, natural person who is a citizen or permanent uh, re uh, resident alien of the United States, or the act in furtherance of the offense was committed in the United States. Next slide. DTS uh, actions are brought in federal district court, uh, but there is another option uh, to redress misappropriation that occurs overseas, and that is to bring an action in what's called the United States International Trade Commission under Section 337 of the Tariff Act of 1930. Um, these, this act requires that the importation of the product or article cont contains the misappropriated trade secret, the misappropriation injuries or threatens to injure the complainant's established industry in the United States, what's called a domestic industry. And finally, elements of the misappropriation prove to demonstrate an unfair trade practice under the Tariff Act. Next slide. The U.S. authority over trade secrets includes where the acts of misappropriation occur entirely outside the United States. As in this example, in the Chien Rui case, a U.S. manufacturer of railway wheels developed a proprietary process and licensed it to Chinese founders. Uh, Amstead's Chinese competitor hired employees from Amstead's Chinese foundries who disclosed those trade secrets to the Tian Rui Group. After finding Tian Rui misappropriated Amstead's trade secrets, the International Trade Commission issued an exclusion order barring the sales of Tian Rui's railway products in the United States. This is a very, very powerful remedy that is imposed by U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. If a product comes into the United States where it it, it, the ITC has found that there is misappropriated trade secrets contained in that product or in that process uh, for the product, um, it can be uh, withheld from moving into U.S. commerce. Thanks, Mark. Yes. There's a question. The question is, could you explain more about the cost of trade secret misappropriation in terms of how you calculate damages for something that could be held as a trade secret forever as compared to patents that have definite term limits? Sure. So in part, there's two ways to there's two ways that we have to look at damages 
for both patents and trade secrets. And that is past damages. Um, the past damages for a trade secret would be up to the three years um, to the time that that uh, trade secret misappropriation occurred. For the patent, uh, of course, you can go back six years uh, for damages, and that is compensatory damages. Um, but quantifying the trade secret misappropriation also requires an assessment of how it, if the product, if a product is already in commerce, what would be perhaps either lost profits to the company that had the trade secret misappropriated? Those lost profits could be calculated um, through direct sales. Um, there, there's also lost opportunity costs, things like price erosion. So if a trade secret was taken and used in a product, for example, that uh, does not operate the way or what that was intended, uh, that could diminish uh, the value of that trade secret for the actual owner of the trade secret and their own products. And so there can be a number of different ways to quantify it. Um, and then the last way, of course, is if you can't determine what the value of that trade secret is uh, versus, a, versus, and this is the same as with a patent, if you can't determine it, then you have to come up with a hypothetical negotiation between the actual owner of the trade secret and the individual who took the trade secret uh, and uh, then ultimately come up with what the a reasonable license fee would be for that. Hopefully that answers the question. I've lost my screen. Hold on just one moment. Okay. Mike, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're still there. The screen's up here for me. Is it on another monitor? Sometimes that happens to me. Yeah, I'm bringing it back up. There we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, well, let me uh, let me continue on. Um, next slide, please. And hopefully, I answered that question uh, for for the for the questioner. So, what are some of the remedies for trade secret misappropriation at the ITC? Again, as I mentioned, it could be a, a an exclusion order which stops the uh, identified uh, article from being imported into the United States, and that is uh, administered by Customs and Border Patrol. Also within the United States, any article that's already in commerce in the United States, a cease and desist order can be issued by the Trade Commission, uh, barring that entity from engaging in any sales of that uh, infringed, that, that uh, activity or that article in the United States if it's found to be uh, part of a, a trade secret misappropriation. And a penalty for violating that cease and disorder can be up to $100,000 per day. Next slide. All right, let's turn next to some actual life sciences cases involving the misappropriation of trade secrets. Um, this first one involved uh, biotech. Um, so this Ohio researcher, Li Chen, um, was a researcher at the Nationwide Children's Hospital Research Institute in Ohio. And she took some trade secrets relating to exosome research. Um, she then returned to China and started a company to sell exosome isolation kits. And at the same time, she received benefits from the Chinese government for biotech research. A uh, side note here, there is legislation currently being passed around Cap Capitol Hill that would punish companies 
who received benefits from their governments where the product at issue was developed using misappropriated US-based trade secrets. Well, Chen and her husband uh, ultimately pled guilty to trade secret theft, and she was sentenced to 30 months and fined $2.6 million. Next slide. So what are some of the takeaways uh, and lessons learned from uh, this particular case? Sometimes trade secret misappropriation can happen even when the owner takes uh, very reasonable measures to protect that information as we discussed. So for example, this nationwide children's hospital took multiple reasonable measures to protect its trade secrets, including restricting physical access through key cards, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and other agreements, restricting its computer network and periodic training. The company should take a multi-pronged approach to confidentiality and periodically remind their employees of their confidentiality obligations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, but it's very important that when an employee is onboarded, uh, they receive information on confidentiality with respect to trade secrets. During the time that they are employed, they should receive annual uh, confidentiality checkups and training. And then when they leave, they should receive exit interviews covering those same issues. Uh, and what the penalties might be for them taking uh, trade secret information to another uh, employer. Next slide. Hey, Mark, I've got a couple questions. Sure. So are there any specific laws that protect manufacture of bar biopharmaceuticals and its processes, either up or downstream, in China and India versus compared to Europe? Yeah, um, this is this is a this is a problem because honestly, um, these countries are far behind the United States uh, in how they uh, have gone about protecting trade secrets. There are some laws in Ch in China that are not heavily that are not uh, heavily uh, you know used. Um, by the government and or by individual companies. There are also some laws in India that I am aware of, but none of them have the same teeth as the Defend Trade Secrets Act or our various state laws using the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. It's also a, a question mark with, you know, what are considerable reasonable measures with respect to IT security and I think perhaps it'd be helpful to just explain how that it's a moving target in the sense how the, you know, as the, as the, we get improvements in, in security, we need to upgrade. And you can yes. talk about that for a moment. Yeah. So in part, I'll go back to, you know, what I indicated before, uh, reasonable efforts as determined by the courts, they're going to look at the specific industry that uh, you're operating in and want to see evidence from you uh, demonstrating that companies like yours um, take certain measures and that you impose those same measures. Again, the uh, reasonable efforts do not need to be heroic. Um, they don't need to be complete, but there has to be a demonstration that especially in IT, things like, and we will talk a little bit about that at the Toward the end of the presentation, I'll be able to show you some slides that walk through some of the things that on the IT side um, companies can do. But again, it's still uh, still uh, tied directly to um, what typically is done in the industry in which you're working. Uh, so that kind of evidence uh, is something that courts are typically looking for. Uh, and again, not heroic. Uh, but just reasonable under the circumstances. Okay, next slide. Oh, let's, we're on this slide. Let's, let's go back. I'm sorry. So uh, another case of foreign theft that you might find interesting involved uh, this particular uh, theft of biotech. Um, Alcor, uh, this company Alifax produced an automated clinical instrument used to determine erythrocyte sedimentation rates in human blood. 
uh, an employee of Mr. Frappa, was involved in the design and development of Alifax's uh, ESR analyzers. Uh, and Frappa then left Alifax and joined another company called Alcor. Well, guess what happened? Within a year, Alcor debuted a new instrument with rapid, I'm sorry, with rapid analytical capabilities comparable to Alifax's devices. A case ultimately went to trial and the jury found that Alcor and, and Mr. Frappa appropriated two of Alifax's trade secrets and awarded Alifax 6.5 million. However, the verdict was overturned by a federal judge uh, who found that the, a new trial was warranted because of an error, a legal error in the case. Let's go to the next slide. So what are some of the takeaways from the Alifax versus Alcor case? The biggest takeaway is that you need to be clear about ownership of the trade secrets. <coughs> Carefully establish ownership of any trade secret that develops during the course of an employee's tenure. <coughs> Excuse me. Make these policies clear to the employees, both in the onboarding process, as I mentioned earlier, and in the confidentiality non-disclosure agreements that you sign with that employee. You also need to take active measures to restrict information access for departing employees. Also, non-compete agreements can be and are powerful tools in preventing former employees from disclosing trade secrets to competitors. Next slide. Okay, so this doesn't have anything to do with life sciences, but I just like the slide and I also like Jimmy Jones. Um, so please note that several states have laws prohibiting the use of non-competes either entirely or impose a limitation of two to three years on such agreements. So they don't want to pro prohibit an individual moving from one company to the next um, if that movement uh, with potential loss of trade secret is going to preclude um, uh, competition in that particular industry. So that's just an ex example of a non-compete agreement uh, that may have some, some limitations on it. Next slide. Hey Mark, we, we got a couple questions. Sure. Um, first one, I'll, I'll let me take a crack and then I can <clears throat> to see if we agree. So, um, and does your group see a difference between early stage biotech companies holding a trade secret versus a patent? The term is more difficult for a company to acquire funding sources from funding from funders like such as VCs. You know, our patents are more stable signaling fact as technology is valid because it meets the bar to patentability versus a trade secret, which has a much broader definition. And I I would agree with that. I think that I think you need both. Um, that you you need both patents and trade secrets, a good trade secret strategy to protect all your confidential information, as Mark has been talking about. But every investor that I've come across in any sort of diligence that we've done, you know, they all count the number of patents that or patent applications that the company yes. has. And numbers matter. Um, so I think you need both. Mark? Yeah, yes. Right. So, yeah. yeah. I, and I would agree. I would agree with that assessment. I think that you do need mm -hmm. both. Um, Obviously, patents have a have a limited lifeline to them. Uh, they last for twenty years. But uh, when you're doing due diligence, or you're getting it ready to acquire another company, new company, uh, or selling, those numbers do count. It's more difficult to quantify trade secrets uh, than the patents, just because of that. Um, but it shouldn't be lost on you that you need both. And there may be very good business reasons as to why you want to keep certain processes confidential versus making them publicly known through a patent. Are there any examples, Mark, of a situation where a company chose the trade secret route and then later found themselves locked out of the market uh, by a competitor who independently discovered or developed that you know, critical well, piece? That that is the risk. I mean, an independent development, as I mentioned, is a complete defense to a misappropriation of trade secret. So you really need to go through an analysis and 
Um, I do have an analysis and I may uh, be able to pull that slide up here uh, of the kinds of things you should think about when determining whether you should take an idea and patent it um, or take an idea and just maintain its confidentiality. We're also gonna talk about a case that has a mix here of both patent and trade secrets. And um, that may also help respond to uh, at least a portion of the question as well. So this next case um, deals with uh, the threat, the theft of a surgery related trade secret. A company by the name of Waveform uh, was a mobile surgery company uh, that would bring its uh, lithotripsy uh, equipment and technicians to various operating rooms uh, in this region to assist surgeons with neurologic procedures, such as treatment of kidney stones. Two of those technician uh, employees in the course of their employment received some specialized training and confidential company information, such as a customer preferences and hospital procedures and pricing. Those employees were in fact subject to and had signed non-disclosure agreements and non-competes. The two employees formed a competing company and used the training and information gained from Waveform to specifically target and solicit Waveform's high producing customers to use uh, their company instead. This was a pretty easy case. Jurors found misappropriation of the trade secrets along with a breach of confidential employment relationship and awarded Waveform $70,000 in damages. Next slide. So what are some of the takeaways here? Um, ensure protection of information at both employee onboarding and departure. So before hiring, uh, uh, conduct a thorough candidate interview. Once hiring is confirmed, promptly conduct an entrance interview to thoroughly communicate confidentiality procedures and responsibilities. And if that employee is expected to have access to trade secret information at that new position, uh, an employment confidentiality agreement should explicitly identify the potential trade secret information and that agreement and that confidentiality agreement should be renewed on an annual basis to reinforce. Courts typically are looking for that kind of thing. That is a reasonable effort that even in this Skin Medica versus Histogram uh, case uh, out of the Southern District California found. The company should also limit access, uh, employee access uh, to the trade secret information on a need to know basis. Next slide. Another takeaway uh, from this uh, is before the employee departs, as soon as an employee informs the company of their departure, the company should immediately monitor and restrict the employee's access to trade secret information. And that includes uh, looking at their email activity or any suspicious activity um, prior to the departure. Next slide. Okay, this next case involves the theft of agricultural tech, something that I know is near and dear to uh, Mike Ward's heart. Um, Zest Labs created a food freshness preservation system using tracking devices and intelligent pallet wrap. The Walmart entered into uh, a number of agreements and tested the Zest system uh, for a few years uh, and then signed a non-disclosure agreement. After terminating its trial with Zest, Walmart announced its own system for freshness preservation and tracking that bore similarities to Zest solution. A jury awarded Zest $60 million for trade secret misappropriation and an additional $50 million uh, because it found the misappropriation to be willful and malicious. That $60 million, that was in compensatories, that was in lost profits. They were able to determine that um, Walmart had taken business from Zest and they were able to quantify that. So that's in response in part to that previous question. And the $50 million of additional uh, money, uh, that was found, uh, it wasn't two times, uh, the 60 million, but typically courts and juries will not award the full amount of uh, com 
of uh, enhanced damages. They'll find some number that they find to be reasonable. Here, they found $50 million. In addition, they awarded $5 million to Zest for a breach of contract, a breach of that non-disclosure agreement. Next slide. The next case involves hair treatment technology. So L'Oreal was trying to figure out how to keep its chemical uh, treatments uh, from damaging hair. So it met with a company called Olaplex, um, a professional hair care pro uh, company in uh, bonding, in the bond building market to discuss a possible sale of Olaplex. Um, an NDA was signed and uh, L'Oreal was permitted to see uh, Olaplex's formulas, books, other proprietary information. And then curiously, L'Oreal then withdrew from those negotiations. Olaplex's technology without Olaplex's consent was subsequently used by L'Oreal to create three new products and they were marketed directly against Olaplex <laughs> for use as a bond builder in connection with chemical treatments for the hair. So not surprisingly, a jury found L'Oreal willfully and maliciously misappropriated uh, Olaplex's trade secret and awarded 22.3 million to Olaplex. Uh, the total judgment came to approximately $50 million following damages enhancements. And in this case, the jury decided to double, essentially, the award plus awarded some attorney's fees as well. Next slide. So what's the takeaway from this theft during business collaborations or partnerships with other businesses? You need to specify the boundaries in that business relationship. Provide terms in the agreements that preserve the obligation to protect trade secrets after any collaboration ends. You need to carefully control the information flow, both externally and internally. Um, store the information separately, password protected. And then trade secret policies should always have future litigation in mind, meaning companies have learned the hard way uh, that each and every page of each and every document containing trade secrets should be clearly marked as confidential. Can't emphasize that more. If you don't do that, courts will have and will um, assume that you've waived confidentiality uh, for any trade secret uh, that does not follow that, that guideline. Next slide. This next slide uh, involves a mix of both trade secrets and patented devices. So LifeSpine uh, manufactured a spinal implant called ProLift and retained Aegis to distribute it. The distribution agreement required Aegis to protect LifeSpine's uh, confidential information, but Aegis funneled information about the ProLift uh, product to its parent company for purposes of developing a competing product. It's amazing what these companies will do. Lifespine secured a preliminary injunction against Aegis, but Aegis argued that a company could not have trade secret protection over the ProLift product because it was patented. However, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals explained that the fact that a product is patented does not prevent aspects of it from also being a trade secret, essentially upholding uh, that injunction. And this is where uh, there was a question that was raised uh, prior to uh, this session. And the question was uh, this, it's sort of similar. Um, and I will address it both in the context of trade secrets and patents. If composition of matter IP has expired, in other words, a patent, uh, has expired on that composition of matter. Is there an effective path to protect that asset in the marketplace via method of use? Well, yes, uh, that method of use can be trade secreted, maintained as confidential, um, and that can be protected in the marketplace using those criterion to protect trade secrets. But it's also quite common in the patent world. So a new method of treating an illness, for example, can be based on an existing compound 
Uh, you just need to make sure that people weren't using that composition for that purpose previously. Usually, you need to tie it to some type of diagnosis uh, and or dosing regimen that is specific to the illness. The other way that companies often extend patent terms on a known composition is by putting it into a new formulation. And we do this all the time for companies that we represent. Um, so a patent on say a painkiller uh, has expired, for example, but that company uh, is patenting new, for example, gel formulations or patenting new gummy formulations or patenting new cold and flu formulations that may include that original but now expired uh, formulation for the painkiller. So those are, those are ways that both trade secrets and patented devices can uh, effectively, after the term of, a, of the composition of matter has expired, uh, still protect the marketplace for a method of use. Next slide. So what are the takeaways here? Um, I thought that if you patented something, uh, it was public. So what can still be secret? Seventh Circuit affirmed the district court's finding in this particular case that the precise dimensions of prolifs, components, subcomponents, and interconnectivity were not disclosed by the diagrams of the patents on the prolif as they did not include measurements. It also found that the trade secrets were protected during sales to hospitals through strictly controlled conditions and at trade secrets shows through supervised display. Sorry, my screen. Uh... There we go. Sorry, my screen froze up there for a moment. Uh, additionally, um, if a business partner uh, also has relationships with competitors, or if the business partner can potentially become a competitor, uh, this requires the business partners to implement uh, measures to protect trade secrets and, res and reserve the right to conduct periodic audits, specific uh, methods and frequency. Next slide. Okay, what are some practice pointers? Think about how to define your trade secrets early on, broad to narrow, and how to describe them in a public complaint. Um, what did the defendant have access to? What might have been incorporated into a competing product? Be aware of all of the ways your information is being disseminated. Do you uh, typically teach courses to partners? Uh, do trade shows? Um, have tech blogs and support blogs? Uh, do YouTube channels. Identify the ways your trade secret could have been disclosed before the defendant does. Know your patents and what you disclose <clears throat> to the Copyright Office. This is particularly important for researchers, lecturers, authors of articles, books, to exercise care in what you disclose beyond what is the subject matter of your patent. As we saw in the previous case, just because you have a patent, that doesn't mean that you've disclosed everything concerning that patent. If you don't disclose, for example, typical measurements related, you may get the patent allowed, but there may be trade secreted information that you are still able to distill and use. And then finally, think about damages. Even if you can't prove trade secrets were actually incorporated into a product, courts have accepted what are called avoided costs models. Your trade secrets taught them what not to do. Remember earlier on in the presentation, I talked about uh, trade secrets that um, will show or research that, uh, that will show that um, the trade secret or the methodology that you're using or the formulation did not work. Well, that can be an avoided cost if that's something that is taken, used, and then during their, their development of their product, uh, they, they choose not to follow the route that, that you did. That, that teaching is also valuable. 
Next, next slide. Hey Mark, got a couple yeah. questions. Yes. Um, so um, you mentioned that employees should have clear instructions regarding trade secrets when you hire and when they leave the company. Yeah. When should you consider having applicants sign some sort of NDA before they interview at the company? Yes. I mean, depending on who the applicant is, if they're going to be exposed to trade secrets and you know that going in, then they should be they should be signing an NDA uh, in the interviewing process or as part of their interviewing process, um, just as you would with uh, you know a partner if you're getting ready to partner with a with another company to come up with some formulation, you should be signing NDAs and doing and going through that kind of uh, disclosure. Are there any differences that exist when you protect? you know, trade secrets for technical versus non-technical trade secrets? No, I mean, the, the same um, elements apply, whether it's a technical trade secret or a non-technical trade secret. Has to be maintained as confidential, uh, can't be out in the public domain. Uh, you have to use reasonable measures uh, to protect that trade secret. So why would any company engage in trade secret misappropriation? Uh, are they... Do they just think they won't get caught or do you think it's sloppy or what do you think it's going uh, you, you, You'd be amazed. I mean, we have 1,400 plus of these cases filed every year annually. And it's usually companies and or employees uh, of those companies uh, thinking that they're going to get away with it, that uh, they won't get caught, uh, that it'll be difficult to prove uh, and so on. But what we're finding is that um, uh, complainants, plaintiffs in these cases are prevailing when they bring actions on, on misappropriation. So it's a big risk, uh, but they, they're trying to get market share. Um, and that's, I think, uh, the biggest impetus behind it. So we have a, a number of students in our class who are you know, grad students and postdocs, some work for companies. and. You know, many, many people in the life sciences industry move from company to company. Sure. Um, any, any tips or suggestions for our students as to, you know, what to be careful about when you move from company A to company B? Yeah, I mean, you should be very upfront about disclosing what your work was when moving to company B, uh, what your work was at company A. Um, most companies i will tell you are not as sophisticated as perhaps they should be um, about onboarding new employees and so when you're moving uh, be very clear about the type of work that you did and also clear about the type of work that you're going to be doing um, for that new employer uh, communication is key here and if you take reasonable efforts to be <clears throat> upfront about um, the knowledge that you have and that you gained from that previous employer, uh, you'll likely uh, stay well out of trouble um, with respect to that new employment situation. What do you think marks the ideal length for an NDA for trade secrets? How long should the protection last? Um, well, I mean, there are some states that actually dictate how long that should take, um, uh, but Typically, a non-disclosure agreement will last indefinitely unless there is um, something uh, that both parties agree to would be a better, lesser term. I've typically seen them last as long as the relationship is in place. Um, but after an employee leaves, um, that employee is still bound by that uh, confidentiality under any NDA that they signed during the course of their employment. Okay, great, thanks. Sure, okay. sure. Yeah. Um, think about uh, these claims, um, additional practice points, think about other claims and how they could affect uh, the case. Uh, patent and trade secret claims are rarely brought together because of the disclosure tension, one is public and one is not. Uh, before filing a case or being involved in filing, consider whether you need to move for some immediate 
relief, and that is what's called a TRO, a temporary restraining order. Consider trade secrets actions at the ITC. If there's foreign conduct involved, that's faster adjudication than a district court action, typically taking 16 months as opposed to 24 to 32 months. Next slide. So clean exit, clean entry. Uh, misappropriation is most likely to occur when, as we just discussed, an employee begins a new uh, job, bringing with her some information from a prior employer, most of the time unwittingly. You may have um, a thumb drive, which has some papers that you drafted during the course of your prior employment. You're not thinking that they may contain trade secret information, but they, they very well might, especially um, if you are a technician, a researcher, student and the like. Or it happens when an employee leaves a job, taking with them information from an old employer. Most of the time, again, unwittingly. Trade secret protection measures uh, offered in the, in the next few slides are geared toward mitigating some of these inbound and outbound trade secret misappropriation risks. And hopefully this will also answer that previous question. Next slide. So, some basic trade secret protection measures. Provisions in an employment agreement should be there to safeguard the company confidential information, and there should be required uh, an annual recertification with that corporate compliance uh, policy uh, with respect to confidential information. Procedures for departing employees. Uh, you should have an exit meeting with your manager, and there should be an employee departure form that's signed, a certification acknowledging your obligation not to divulge proprietary information. There should be an exit survey uh, for voluntary separation, um, and uh, there should be a review of computer usage in the weeks prior to departure to detect any improper conduct. That may sound like an invasion of privacy, uh, but that is something that should be conducted and that courts will be looking for uh, as some of the evidence. Uh, procedures for onboarding new employees. There should be, of course, an entrance interview with that manager. And the employee onboarding form there should include a similar certification acknowledging that you do not possess proprietary information from previous employers. Next slide. Physical. Security measures. Um, this is just before we get into the IT part, which will go back to a previous question. Protection of perimeter, grounds from unauthorized access. Uh, many of you have, have done this, have had these kinds of things. Employees, you have a badge. If you're a contractor, you have a different type of badge with some time restriction on it. Uh, if you're a visitor, you have a paper badge, and then you have some escort. Authorized access to more restricted buildings business manager authorizes it, so on, emergency access. Next slide. Hey, Mark, before you go yes. on, question, and first question, and then I think I can answer it, and I'll let, let you tackle the second part of it. So first yes. was, are venture companies willing to sign NDAs? And in my experience, they, they never sign them. Um, That's right. Um, but the, the related question is, is, you know, VCs will be sitting on the boards of multiple companies with overlapping technology. And how, how do you protect trade secrets in this situation? Yeah, so with respect to the first part of the question, I will say this. Um, in the context of litigation funding arrangements where there are venture capitals involved with these companies looking for litigation funding, there is a requirement that before the disclosure of any confidential information concerning a litigation going forward that an NDA be signed by those VCs. But I agree with you, Mike, that normally VCs don't sign these agreements. No. And then what was the second part of the question? I didn't... Well, just really how, uh, you know, do you protect yourself against a you know, VC sitting on, you know, multiple boards? With... Yeah, well, uh, the way I typically protect is I'm very clear and upfront and I tell them, um, you know, as a representative of the, you know, of my client, that the information I'm about to reveal to you is public. Um, it's not, there isn't any confidential information. If you desire confidential information, 
or need that to make your assessment, then you're going to have to sign in a, a, a non-disclosure agreement or some other confidentiality. Yeah, I, I, w- I would think in a board meeting setting um, that, you know, as a as a board member, then you, you would have confidentiality obligations yes. To, yes. To, the, to the company yeah. that you're sitting on the board for. Right, right. Yeah. I agree. So go, going to next, these virtual security measures, and this goes to the IT question. So typically you're going to have login requirements, there's going to be firewalls, security audits um, that are done on a monthly basis, typically. There's software tools, servers, desktop computing, and portable devices. Um, require encryption of data sent to third parties. Regularly run uh, to date any malware, antivirus software programs, pay particular attention to security of web applications and require smarter password management. Next slide. This also comes up, which is very important and typically is what I find in cases where employees and employers get burned. And that is with respect to bring your own device policies. But here are some key provisions that you should keep in mind or that companies that you're working with should keep in mind and that you as an employee moving to and between companies should keep in mind. Make use of personally owned devices voluntarily, giving employees the option of using a company device instead. Impose technical security standards as a condition of network access, including encryption, remote white, and password protection to ensure that the device is protected at the same level as would any other company issued device. Make use of personally owned devices conditional on employees' consent to the company's ability to monitor or remotely wipe company data. Again, this may sound like it's an invasion of privacy, but um, this is something that is allowed by courts and expected, um, and there is no inv- there is no um, uh, protection right under the Fourth Amendment to this kind of uh, monitoring. Should prohibit the use of any file sharing applications while connected to the company's network. Uh, things like Snapchat, Instagram, but also things like Dropbox, Box that we typically see. Give clear notice, especially monitoring and remote white functions to avoid breach of any employee privacy laws or regulations. And obtain a signed agreement to a BYOD policy prior to allowing any network access from a personally owned device. And then next slide. Finally, um, create and be involved in that culture of data security. Implement a regular schedule of employee training and attend it. Uh, Regularly remind employees of company policy concerning uh, keeping uh, that information secure and confidential. Know which employees have access to sensitive information and limit the number of employees to sensitive information to only those with a need to know. Use software within the company to prevent copying, printing, emailing of critical trade secrets. Involve functions across the company in data security, uh, including human resources. And then finally, consider creating a data security committee. And this is one of the favorite things that I typically um, uh, provide in my counseling to, to clients. And that is creating a data security committee that involves all the different corporate functions with a need to know that trade secret information, have individuals meet on a regular basis to audit corporate security practices and meet to keep pace with how employees are actually using that latest technology. So, Mark, we're, we're up against yeah. it. Oh, perfect timing. This is great. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Folks, there were lots of questions. We know that people have additional questions. Uh, Feel free to email us and we'll be happy to chat. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Have a good day. Okay, thank you. Take care, everyone.